Good afternoon. It's very good to see everybody today. Um, and we're so glad uh, that you've turned out to help us celebrate Founders Day. The Martinsville Henry County Historical Society is very pleased that you took time to come out, share with us, and recognize the important subject that was once so important to our area. We feel that we should remember and respect the textile era, what it did to create prosperity in our region, and to better understand what happened to it and what lessons that we can learn. The board members wish to thank our generous annual sponsors, Carter Bank and Trust and Lester Group Incorporated. We also wish to thank our individual contributors and our many wonderful members. Without your support, it would be impossible to support our efforts, including keeping this beautiful facility up and running. As always, we encourage you to become a member of our society. And if you're interested, um, find any one of us uh, board members and we'd be glad to uh, uh, direct you on how to do that. Uh, today, our keynote speaker is Will Panel, who along with many other accomplishments has a deep appreciation of area history. Will worked for Panel Knitting Company for five summers during high school and college. And in May of 1977, he graduated from Hampton Sydney College on a Saturday and went to work at Panel the following Monday. He worked in various departments, including running the bank of 14 Tompkins knitting machines. Anybody know what that is? Okay, because he taught me what that was. Um, from 1978 to 1982, he worked as a sales representative out of the sales office in New York City. Today, he will be discussing the various textile companies that were part of Martinsville and Henry County during the 20th century. After Mr. Panel finishes, we will open the floor up for a question and answer session and general discussion from the floor. You're welcome to tell any stories that you may have heard about your experience uh, in textiles at the time as well. I've had the opportunity to get to know Mr. Panel while working on the Founders Day planning, and he contains a wealth of knowledge and has experienced many interesting things throughout his career. Mr. Panel, we are proud and honored today to welcome you as our keynote speaker. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, Andy, thank you and the Historical Society for having me. Um, I'm going to have to bear with me. I was thinking about it on the way over here, and the last research project I did was 47 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you for being here, and I'm going to try to take you through a brief PowerPoint. Uh, but before that, everybody here that worked in, in textiles here in Martinville and Henry County, or a family members did, please stand up. Thank you. So this is a brief history of textiles in Martinville and Henry County. Uh, that's uh, Jobber's Pants Factory, panel knitting on the right, Coltex office on the bottom right, and I, I can't really see what that other one is, but I'll see. That's DuPont, and I've got a, uh, let's see. So Andy, this is not, the, the copy's not on this, or is it further That's right, copy's not, it's on your Okay, paper. all right, so we start with DuPont, uh, 1941 to 1988. In, in 1940, a group from DuPont Corporation in Delaware came south to look for a location to build an nylon plant. As they passed through Martinville on, on Route 58 West, one of them looked up the window and spotted Horseshoe Bend Farm across the Smith River. Now there's a great spot. That would make a beautiful location for a plant. The remarks sent the group doubling back to Martinville to start negotiations. DuPont could have picked anywhere in the state to build their plant, but they picked Martinsville because of the human factor. The DuPont site seekers reported stability in every phase of community life. The plant opened in 1941. They made nylon fiber and yarns. Their main product became a hosiery yarn called Cantrice. During World War II, they made yarn for parachutes, and during the Cold War, Martinville was thought of as a possible military target. 
1971, the plant employed approximately 4,400 workers. Fieldcrest Mills. Fieldcrest Mills in the town of Fieldale was built by Marshall Fuel Company around the turn of the century. They built a post office, hotel, two churches, barber shop, a community center with two pools, drugstore, produce store, theater, and a bank. They also provided houses for employees with low rent. The company made towels, sheets, and other bedding products. In the 1950s, Marshall Field Mill was sold to Fieldcrest Mills. In 1985, Fieldcrest merged with Cannon Mills. In 1997, Fieldcrest Cannon was purchased by Philotex Corporation, which closed in 2003. <coughs> Panel Walker Underwear Company. Panel Walker Underwear Company opened in 1934. The plant made children's misses and ladies' bloomers, as well as infant shirts and coats and boys' and men's t-shirts. The company was run by Gordon Banks and Robert Panel and Sam, Samuel S. Walker, Vice President. Virginia Underwear Corporation. Virginia Underwear Corporation opened in 1928, making cotton knit underwear for women and children. The company registered the name Snoozer, which is a one-piece children's sleeping garment, which covered the top and bottom, as well as the feet. Was run by S.S. Walker, George Fox Jr., Gordon Panel, and Heck Ford. A uh, little sidebar to this one: I had a pair of snoozers when I was a kid, <laughs> and my suit. And again, it has a it, it has a foot on it. You know, the foot, it covers the foot. So I was running down the hall, and my st sister stepped on the front of my foot, and I knocked out my two front teeth. <laughs> Hampton Wren Corporation. Hampton Wren Incorporated opened in 1937. Its 30 employees made t-shirts, sweatshirts, and coat sweaters. Approximately 50,000 garments were made annually. The plant was run by the Cross family. Lacey Manufacturing Corporation. Lacey Corporation was organized in 1942 by Frank M. Lacey. They specialized in making full zip nylon jackets for men, boys, and girls. They also made men's and boys swimwear. The company was purchased by Panel Knit Company around 1980. Is that right, Rusty? Maybe a little later than that. A little no, later no, than 1980. That's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> and uh, let's see, which gave Panel needed additional sewing capacity. see a picture of Jobber's Pants Factory, but that's on my list, so let me tell you about that one. Jobber's Pants Factory opened in 1933 in the Spencer Brothers Tobacco Factory on Fayette Street. A second plant opened in an old tobacco building on Adele Street. A third plant was originally opened in an old wooden dance hall and was later moved to a permanent building constructed on Elizabeth Street just below the Stanfield Miller Funeral Home, and that, that building is still, still standing. The plant specifically opened to employ black women in 1936. By 1939, it employed over 1,000 women who were producing 1,200 pairs of pants a day. In the 1960s, another plant was opened on Cavill Avenue. Standard Garments was eventually purchased by Hampton Industries, becoming Hamco Apparel. Okay. Will Panel comes to town. The story of Martinsville, the sweatshirt capital of the world. Panel Knitting Company. William Letcher Panel was born in Wentworth, North Carolina in 1880. His first job was minding his father's general store. At the age of 23, he went to work at Mayo Cotton Mill in Mayadan, North Carolina. All he knew about long underwear was it was made up north from yarn spun in North Carolina. Mr. Panel was eager to learn and the decision was made to send him up north to Utica Knitting Mills, which made, made the long underwear. They are pushing a broom, cleaning lint on the floor from the knitting machines. He learned all the intricacies of making long underwear. He had a photographic memory and a phenomenal understanding of complicated machinery. When he returned, he started a knitting operation to, at Mayo Mills. 
P.H. Haynes of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, heard about this and offered Panel a job as superintendent of his new operation in the P.H. Haynes Knitting Company. Panel soon realized that making long underwear in the, in the South from yarn, Southern yarn could easily compete with the Northern knitting mills using the same yarn. Mr. Panel chose Martinsville, Virginia as a site for his new plant after being visited by Heck Ford and R.P. Gravely seeking him to build a plant here. Panel has two good reasons to choose Martinville for a site. One was his future wife was from nearby Spencer, Virginia, and two, the wives of the men working in the furniture factories would make excellent sewing machine operators and it would give them a good sense of pride. To house a new panel unit purchased to build it, Pan, how's the new unit panel purchased a building on the corner of Cleveland Avenue and Water Street from R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company who had just closed the plant there. The new company was named Panel Knitting Company. Will Panel died in 1940 and Gordon Panel became president. Gordon Panel died in 1947 and Johnny Gregory was named president. Bill Panel was only 13 when his father died in 1940 and he became president in 1966. In the late 70s, John Decker was named president and Bill Panel became chairman of the board. Panel Knitting was sold to Cyril Lee Knit Products, owner of the Haynes brand, in 1990. <laughs> Daddy Bill. Bassett Walker Knitting Company. Samuel Stanhope Walker was born into a textile family. He attended NC State to study textiles. Afterwards, he served in the military during World War I. <clears throat> he returned to Martinsville, and with the help of Will Town, he started Virginia Underwear Corporation, which was housed in a building on Cleveland Avenue built by Pan. Later, a second building was built, and Mr. Walker purchased both from Pan. Virginia Underwear Corporation was renamed Walker Knitting Company, which later merged with Bassett Walker Knitting Company, located in Bassett, Virginia and the company became known as Bassett Walker Knitting Company in 1941 with Samuel S. Walker as president. The company purchased 70 acres on the Smith River south of Martinsville. In 1960, Sam Walker suffered a fatal heart attack at the age of 63. L. Dudley Walker, his son, then became president of Bassett Walker. In the same year, the company moved to its new location on the Smith River south of town. Bassett Walker was purchased by VF BF Vanity Fair Corporation in October of 1984. Sail Knitting slash Tultex. Sail Knitting was started in 1937 in a building on Moss Street by Will Panel. Panel's son-in-law, Mike Sale, was its first president. Sail Knitting was the first of the three companies to make sweatshirts and the first company in the South to do so. In the 30s, the crew neck sweatshirt had become a fast selling item. Companies in Norwich, Connecticut, and Utica, New York had a monopoly on sweatshirt products. Panel decided to challenge this monopoly by setting up a sweatshirt division in its Cleveland Avenue plant and later moved Sale Knitting to a building on Moss Street. Panel's son in law, Mike Sale, became president. The Henry J. Tully Corporation out of New York City became the sales agency. Sale changed its name to Tully Corporation Virginia and soon thereafter the name was changed to Tultex. Panel's son-in-law, Bill Frank, was CEO of the company and later his son, John, became CNO, CEO. Tultex ceased operations in 1999. Those are some Tompkins knit machines which we'll talk about in a little bit, but they are, um, they were a perfect machine, as old as they were, they're still perfect machines. And that's Bill Frank, uh, CEO of Toltex. Okay, no, I don't, uh, Plume Incorporated, this slide one too many, one too many, too far in front, but anyway, 1986, a, group of local men with textile experience formed Plume Incorporated. Their plants were located in Martinville, Stewart, Chatham, Rocky Mount, and Eden, North Carolina. They made sweatshirts, t-shirts, and some Jersey knit products. They ceased operations in 1999. The 
four sweatshirt producers in Martinsville <clears throat> enjoyed friendly competition for many years, enjoyed visiting each other, each other at various trade shows across the country. They had men and ladies softball teams and bowling teams. They employed thousands of people in Martin and Henry County, the sweatshirt capital of the world. During the 70s and early 80s, three things happened that really boosted the sale of sweatshirts. First, the energy crisis in the early 70s caused people to turn down the thermostats and put on their sweats. The, this is one y'all don't know about, not many of you. The Euclid shirt in Europe, Everybody wanted to wear a sweatshirt with UCLA printed on it. <laughs> and so they, they didn't even know what UCLA was, but they had to have a Euclid. <laughs> uh, so that, that's really what got sweatshirts going over in Europe, and it caused a real craze. Uh, number three would be Flashdance and the Pastels. In the movie Flashdance, the girl takes a crew neck sweatshirt, cuts off the sleeves and the rib neck, and U.S. girls went crazy. This was followed by pastel colors such as pink, manacqua, light purple, lemon yellow, and white. All girls had to have them all. Then NAFTA in 1944. Then came NAFTA in 1944, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Ross Perot once referred to NAFTA as a giant sucking sound. Since 2001, over 3.2 million Americans have lost their jobs in China, Southeast Asia, or Mexico. Many of them were in Martinville and Henry County and the surrounding area. So that's, that's a brief history. That's Ronald Reagan with a pair of sweatpants. That, that, picture, that picture hung over my mother's bed. <laughs> I studied it closely many times, and I'm almost positive those sweatpants were made in March. <laughs> um, so, as as we talked about before, I hope people will stand up and tell some stories. I'll tell a couple to begin with uh, about my experiences at panel, and uh, I guess. One of my favorites is uh, when I first took over to sail, and uh, I got the Southeast Territory, and one of my, my one of my customers was Belk down in Charlotte, it's Belk Store Services, which is a buying agency for all the independent Belk store owners. And Bassett Walker pretty much had the men's and boys department locked up on that. So I would go down there twice a year, and. The buyer didn't want to see me, and I knew I wasn't going to get any business from him, so, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty tough. But um, fortunately, uh, as, the, as the pastel colors and the fashion flash dance stuff came out, um, I was in New York City, and, and the ladies' department, uh, their buyers were in New York. So I went down there to see them, and the merchandise manager just, he called them ice cream colors the uh, pastel and he loved those and so I got into the Bassett Walker ladies department and uh, ladies and girls and, and that was you know I, I was real proud of that because you know Bassett Walker thought they had the whole thing locked up and uh, they didn't think about the ladies department so yeah it will <laughs> um, So uh, another another thing that in, in New York City they had a lot of whole independent wholesalers that we all sold to. So they had a show called the Natal Show, and that's National Association of Textile Wholesalers. And it was a pretty sad show, but we had to go up there and support our wholesalers. And it was in a in a second rate hotel, and so one year all the sales sweat all the sales samples got stolen overnight <laughs> and so the next year they stole Bassett Walker samples and so the big joke was well panel you're next but I think they sh I think they quit having the show before they had a chance to steal our samples <laughs> um, and then I'll, I'll I'll jump in with another story about racing uh, later on but is it anybody got a something they would like to tell 
Lucy. Okay. Well, this was all before my time, but um, <clears throat> Granddaddy Panel was in his office, and one of his many children, Yanni Smith, <clears throat> I don't know if she was married then, but she was working at the mill, as all of them did, and Yanni was somewhere, it probably could be any department that was real hot, no air conditioning, of course, not back then. And she got so uncomfortable that she got all the women working with her to go with her to the office and complain. <laughs> to her father and boss. <laughs> and they made a real presentation, did all their complaining, and waited for the reply. And all they really wanted were some more big fans. So after a moment, Granddad said, you ladies go back to your job. Yanni, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard no. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bradley, I was in the furniture business while all the knitting business was going on, but uh, we had a good association with panel. Uh, those who worked, I think, was it forty or fifty years? They got a free grandfather clock, yeah. and I know I, I know the at least 10, because I delivered 10 of them, but I think he had several employees that worked a minimum 40 or 50 years. He was 50, and I think it was at least 10. Yeah, that was, it was nice. I think it was all women, too. Yeah, it was, it was. <laughs> all right. Well, I got a story to tell. Oh, okay. We uh, we didn't put our tags in there unless people wanted to pay fifty five cents a dozen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that, that was in the beginning. Then we then we realized what how important the brand was, so we started selling them. All right, who else? Yeah, well, Steve Beans, uh, we had a government contract at one time, I don't know if you remember this, uh, for sweatshirts, sweatpants for the military. So the inspector came down and inspected and plunked us. So uh, Mr. Panel came to me, I was quality control manager, said, how can we fix this? I said, well, Mr. Panel, the best way to do it would be to have the quality girls re-inspect the stuff and when they come down and give us that list of the boxes they want, we just take that list and apply it to them boxes. He said, I like the way you think. We passed them from then on, no problem. And they would give me the check and I'd have to take it back to the office. It would be like eighty, a hundred thousand uh, dollars the government guy would bring with him over to the warehouse. So uh, Mr. Pannell said he liked the way I thought on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but just a question. I don't know if you know the answer, but do you know why your granddad and Mr. Walker had such a liking for each other and, and were partners in a couple of those early business? No, I don't. Uh, other than than they were both uh, smart guys that wanted to and knew that Martinsville and Henry County was a place to be. Uh, and they, they were, had, had, had the same things in mind, I guess you'd say. I wish I could have known them both. Who else? Okay. I was raised up in a mill town, there in Field Down. And Fieldcrest was so important to us at that time. My dad was a police officer there. And uh, for 56 years, they asked him to watch the town for two days, about a couple of weeks until they could find somebody. 56 years later, we were still watching. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody in that mill 
real town had a nickname. <laughs> Nobody knew my brother's name. His name was Flop. Well, Shaq Myers was a coach there, and his little daughter could not pronounce my name, Doug. She, she, she called me Stud. <laughs> <laughs> Pace Lamp, and my dad and Richard Perlman started a company, Perlman and Pace. And um, I couldn't tell you the amount of work they did for all the mills in town. But um, I'm internally grateful because I'm one of seven children, and all that um, mill work put all seven of us through college. And we couldn't have done that without the textile business here. And thank you, Will, and thank you, Daddy Bill, and thank you, Granddaddy Will. <laughs> Okay, anybody else? I'm glad to know the story about the UCLA sweatshirts. We were over in Switzerland and touring around, and this was back in the 80s, I think. And uh, I saw this guy with a UCLA sweatshirt, and I said, oh, you're from the States. No, we didn't know who UCLA was. <laughs> well, most of them didn't know what they had on. They just wanted to have a Euclid shirt on. <laughs> it, was, it was funny. Okay. But uh, along with the UCLA thing, was, uh, Mr. Walker used to tell the story about uh, the number 44. Uh, so David Thompson at NC State was using, and Mr. Walker and his father went to NC State. And uh, so in the early 70s, when David Thompson was big and state won the national championship and all that, they somehow made some number 44s that really didn't have anything to do with David Thompson. And, and they weren't decorating apparel very much then. And somehow it clicked. And David Thompson was the greatest college basketball player for, <laughs> for a long time. And, so he was fascinated, Douglas was fascinated that this generic number, nothing but a number, became their number one seller in, in decorated apparel, uh, not unlike the UCLA. <laughs> so a lot of them didn't know it was David Thompson. No, they didn't know. A <laughs> big brand number 44. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> way back to it. <laughs> okay, Rusty. Oh, I'm Rusty Lacey. Uh, it's really interesting how what Mr. Panel started uh, so many years ago branched out in so many different places. My dad, Frank Lacey, as we, you saw, started Lacey Manufacturing Company. But he did it with the help of uh, Mike Sayer, uh, who was a son-in-law. My dad was a son-in-law of Mr. Powell, too. They had a lot of daughters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Mike Sayer evidently saw the need for a, not knitting, they was already taken care of, a cut and sew operation, making Jackets started out with jackets, and he convinced my dad, who at the time was a school teacher at Marshall Hospital and a coach, and I think he was principal too, to give all that up and start this business from scratch. And I remember my dad telling stories about how he actually went downtown and bought a cheap nylon jacket from a store in town, ripped it apart, made patterns from it, and then made it smaller and larger and so forth, and began making the jackets. And he said, back then, I think it was during uh, the war in the 40s, he said, you couldn't buy a zipper because all the metal was going to the war effort. So 
They had buckets. The first jacket they made had buckets. I wish I had one, but I don't. But uh, it's funny how Mr. Panel had a hand in all of these textiles that have been just about all of them in the area. He either helped somebody start or sent his uh, son-in-law over to do this one or start help uh, his other son-in-law through his brother-in-law started another one. So it was really interesting how it all branched out. And uh, it was a good time for Martinsville. It, those of you that were around back then know that with DuPont and the furniture all going crazy and the sweatshirt mill, Martinsville was a very wealthy town to live in, very prosperous. Thanks. Thank you, Russ. <coughs> Chuck Fred. Well, I'm Jim Fred with the Buffalo Story of Good Construction. And the knitting business as well as the furniture business was very tied to construction businesses here, Standard Oil Corporation and other. And at one time we had over 200 employees. Um, we did a lot of work for the, the textile industry as well as for the Walsh Corporation. When I was a a little, little kid, I had a lawnmower business when I was 10 years old through 15. I made 15 50 a week, mowing four lawns a week. I had three at 350 a four and $5 yard. And it wasn't anything for a kid to spend money on, so I put all this money in a desk drawer. My father came in when I was 15, and he looked at my own work and said, You got a problem now. So I opened the desk drawer to get my razor, and all this money just <laughs> and he said, what are you going to do with all that money? I said, I don't know. I think I might go duck on the business or something. He said, I tell you what, let's go down and, and we went down the store and I bought a boat and bought me a motor and a gas can to keep it in a paddle and a life preserver to take the rest of the money and invest it. He took that money and put it in a $4 pan stock. <laughs> and banned it with private and it was $5 and $10 a share. So when all the shareholders, employees that had stock in Paddle, Coltex, Bassett, Walker, we all thank you all for what you did in this community. And you have allowed us to do that Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Who else? I've got a question on something about our numbers. Burger Burgers and Anderson and Rocky Jack and Rocky Mountain. Who is it? Burgers. They, they were, uh, the plant they had on 220 is not them anymore. They closed that about 20 years ago. But um, I don't know whether they moved or. I think they had a plant in Franklin County. Yeah. You know, Rusty? They probably closed like all the rest of them. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. I'm just a low person, but anyway, I'm Susan Dove, and I want to thank you for jobs. I started at Lacey Corporation. I worked in the production department. I then went to panel meeting when panel meeting bought Lacey, worked in the production department, went on to work in the accounts payable, and I'm going to tell you what, I enjoyed my jobs at these companies. They cared about their employees. They gave jobs to, to people here in the town. And I continue to work for Mr. Panel. And I am very proud of it. So, thank you. Well, thank you, Sue. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed your job. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? I was a newcomer here in 57. And it made my Christmas shopping so easy because you won't believe this, not everybody had sweatshirts then, but everybody wanted a sweatshirt. So all my family got new sweatshirts every year. <laughs> Russ? Well, uh, Susan just reminded me of something. Uh, back in the heyday of the sweatshirt business, I guess it was in the 70s, wasn't it? Pretty yeah, much. 70s and 80s. Uh, for a while, I was the, uh, back then we call it personnel manager at Lacey 
Corporation. And I was to do the hiring, interviewing and hiring. And back then, there was so little unemployment. And if somebody was working at Panel or Toltex and they got mad at the boss, they could leave at noon and be working the next morning at Lacey or the other. <laughs> that, you know, basically, if they were breathing, you'd give them a shot. <laughs> Else? You want to explain the photo for us again? The what? Oh, okay. Um, we, uh, the biggest show, the biggest apparel show in the country was called the Magic Show. That stands for Men's Apparel Guild in California. Well, it got so big, they had to move it to Las Vegas. They didn't change it to MAG. Ma magic, uh, magic show, they left it magic show, but they moved it to Las Vegas. Anyway, we all went out, all, all the three companies and or four companies. Did Plume ever do that? We did. Okay, so all four sweatshirt manufacturers, Markville, had a booth at the magic show, and it wasn't to sell product, it was to support our wholesalers and our, our and to see, see and have dinner with their retailers as they were out there. Uh, but every, everybody went to the shows and, and you basically, if you want anybody to come in your booth, you had to have a celebrity in there. So <laughs> we, we had just, panel had just started a new line of poly cotton printable sportswear sweatshirts um, called Ultra Sweats. And <clears throat> uh, so we, uh, this is our first year with the brand, and so we, we got Gilligan from Gilligan's Island to be our celebrity. And so we got in the minnow with him, and that's Mike Kleintobe in there with me. His, his dad ran pound for a couple of years. Um, and uh, so, you know, everybody had somebody, or nobody came to their booth. <laughs> There's, there's one, uh, who else? Okay, there's one other thing I'd like to say about panel. Um, I was in the New York office for four years and um, one Monday morning I was flying home from New York to do my Southeast calls that week. And uh, I ended up sitting by Buddy Aaron. He, he, had just, he was coming back from the NASCAR banquet. And so I, I've been following him in the paper since I was in, in school then in Georgia. Just, you know, because I was homesick and I'd, I'd see what, how our Martinville driver was doing. So anyway, I ended up sitting by him and, and, and uh, talking to him. And by the time we landed in Greensboro, we had about half a deal done on, on sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we. I, I felt that, it would, that the employees would appreciate that, and I, you know, some of them did, some of them didn't. But um, it was it was good for Buddy, and it was good for us, I think, it, for, for more, mainly just morale, not really advertising or anything. But so then it, that kept on with me, and, and uh, a, a race became available at Martinville for, for for us to sponsor, and so I worked out a deal with. Speedway, and we did that. <laughs> and you know, my, my father wasn't really keen on racing, but I, I said to my father, I said, Daddy, if I invite you to the race, will you come? He said, I'll come if you invite me, but please don't invite me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we had a we had a good time. We had uh, if you, we sponsored two years in a row, and if you sponsor a race, you get what's called a winner's circle driver, and that's somebody that won a race the year prior. Well, the first first year we, we got uh, Morgan Shepherd, and um, so what we did then, we, we had the Winston Cup, that red race car they had that they just take as a show car. Well, it was a real race car, and uh, so Morgan did hot laps with 
some of the employees at Panel and some of my friends around Marple Speedway, and it didn't have a right seat. You had to sit on the floor on a burlap sack and hold on to the roll bar. And, and he, he was going about as fast as they do in the race. So that was pretty scary, but that, that was cool. And then um, the next year we had Dale Earnhardt. And so I took Dale around to a, a, all around the Cleveland Avenue plant, the sewing rooms, the dye house. One guy had a Bill Elliott hat on. He was flashing at a Dale. He was, I bet he don't win. <laughs> so I thought that was a pretty good morale builder for the for the company, and um, and that that was a lot of fun. So um, and right here, this is a uh, uh, Ultra Sweats printable sweatshirt signed by. All of these drivers, and even even the non-race fans are going to recognize most of them. Bill Elliott, Daryl Walter, Harry Gant, Michael Walter, Rusty Wallace, Davey Allison, Ken Schrader, Sterling Marlin, Richard Petty, Dale Jarrett, Larry Pearson, Junior Johnson, Terry Labonte, Neil Bonnet, Kelly Yarborough, and Alan Colwicky. So I'm, I'm very proud of this shirt. We have up here on the table behind me, over here, a picture of my grandfather and, and some other memorabilia from Toltex, Bass Walker, and Panel. Anybody, when we get through, if anybody wants to come up here and look at it, you're welcome to. Um, that pretty much in, ends my comments. If anybody else has anything, please let me know. like to thank uh, the sources that I got most of my information from. The Blender Magazine, which is a DuPont publication from November 1951, had some great history in that. Uh, Yesterday and Today, the Bassett Printing Company, and Foresight Founders and Fortitude. That, that's the source for most of my information, and some of it is just in, out of my head. <laughs> So, uh, thank you all, all for being here. Uh, I'm really proud of uh, all of our textiles that we had in Markham and Henry County. Um, I'm sorry that it's gone now, but uh, it, was, it was great while it was, it was here, and um, we still have a great city and county to be proud of. So, thank you all. Thank you all for coming out. Um, uh, also wanted to mention real quick, uh, um, wanted to give recognition to Thatcher Stanley, who is with uh, Congressman Morgan Griffith. He uh, snuck in at some point. I saw him. I don't know where he went now. But there he is right there. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate you uh, and, and your representative there uh, being with us. Um, I want to thank Will again for doing this. Uh, I just want to say the uh, Textile industry is something I was never, never involved in. Um, but when I was younger, uh, I was um, I was the assistant store manager when I was 20 years old over at the uh, 
ref code that was in Stanley Town. And, and, it, and you may not know this, but that ref code was the highest volume store in the whole district out of any, like within this part of Virginia, that store was so busy. And one of the reasons why, obviously, was because of the furniture plants, but also because we had Bassett Walker. Uh, it was the only ref code that serviced that area. And I remember, I just remember, like yesterday, I still remember all of these Bassett Walker employees would come in and talk to me. And, 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 and as soon as five o'clock hit, you know, that's when everybody's coming in to get their prescriptions or whatever, you know, whatever. But also as a kid, I remember going to uh, the outlet store. That was a big deal too. Like I remember, um, you know, mom and dad saying, we're going to the outlet store on, I guess it was Saturday morning or something and going to buy sweatshirts or jeans or whatever. And those are memories that I think all of us have something like, and they stick with you forever. Uh, Cause I don't even know where there's an outlet store now, but you know, you think about stuff like that. It was part of your life. You just went and you bought clothing and that was, you didn't think, think about it at the time. And it's not there now. And you know, you, you kind of think, well, that was sort of a nice, Thing that my kids will never have an understanding of. So, but again, I think that it's important to know this history. It's important, and I know there's a lot of sadness to it as well. Um, but there's also a lot of things, especially for those of us who are into history, we look back and we think about this is the things that made us what we are right now. So we have to take what that was and figure out how do we make the best. Of, of what came out of that. And that's the way I look at it. And again, that's just me and my thoughts. And I just, on behalf of the society, I want to thank you all for coming by today. Uh, I'm going to put this slideshow on uh, on the loop so that anybody wants to kind of linger around and look at the pictures. I know we kind of went through them kind of quick. Um, and also, um, as Will said, you can come up and view the materials that are on the desk as well. Um, thank you very much. Appreciate it.